Glad to see everyone. You persevered and got here. Way to go. We have some whoppers of verses today. Oh, thank you. Got it. No, I remember. Evelyn. Got a message from Evelyn. She says hi, and she misses everyone. Is that it? All right. But Butch messaged me uh, like 30 minutes ago that she had a good night's rest. So that's a big victory. We don't think it, you know, when we regularly get good rest, but it's a big thing. Praise the Lord. We're in Revelation chapter 1 today. Last week, we looked at who the revelation was from, and the abridged version of that is that it's from the Trinity, from the Father, from the Son, from the Spirit, and who it was to. Immediately, it was to the seven churches, seven literal churches, and to you and me. Um, it was given for the purpose of showing it to Christ's bondservants. It was meant to be circulated around, just like any other letter uh, of the New Testament to the churches. And now we'll get into the contents. So beginning with verse 7 of chapter 1. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for every revelation that you have ever given to man within our own lives, Lord, the little, little things that, that we've forgotten and the big things, Lord, and revealing yourself through the scriptures, all the characteristics of you. Thank you for your son, Lord, the greatest revelation of yourself and, and us being able to look at the life that he lived and the way that he moved and spoke, the way he behaved and just see, God, we thank you. Thank you for the text before us this morning. Please speak it right into our hearts, Lord. Implant it deep. Let it yield fruit. Let it give increase. Let us be fashioned to it. Let us exalt it in our life and, and lift it up in our minds, Lord. Keep it at the forefronts. Keep it before our eyes. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, Lord. You're our vision. We're looking to you now, Lord. Give us ears to hear. By your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. It's taking everything in my being not to yell, Behold! Because that's the way that we would best understand it. Now, if everyone's in a room fellowshipping, conversing, and someone comes in a side door, Behold! Everyone's going to just turn their eyes to him. It's going to grasp you. It's an, a, an attention arrester. And that word is used 25 times in the book of Revelation. I suspect we best pay attention. So what, for what reason does John grab our attention that, that he, he's doing a full stop? Behold, he is coming with the clouds. That's worth tuning in for. Before this event, we're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as those, excuse me, as, as, as do the rest with have no hope, who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, and there's that harpazo in the Greek, 
rapturo in Latin, will be raptured, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, there's no indication that anyone will see and bear witness and behold the rapture as it occurs. But everyone will see Christ's second coming. Jesus will take us first, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and then he brings us with him at his return in Revelation chapter 19, verse 14. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11 tells us this will be the fashion of our Lord's coming. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witness both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifting up, excuse me, he was lifting up while, while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven, which was on the clouds. Therefore, he is coming in the same way on the clouds. Uh, they won't be Cirrostratus, I'll tell you that much. They're going to be cumulonimbus, big, glorious, thundering, rain-bringing clouds, fluffy monsters that, that bring rain. It's going to be incredible. And all these people on the ground, looking up, seeing the God-man arriving in the sky, just riding on clouds, as declared in the Old Testament as well. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And again in Matthew 24, verse 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great joy. So John tells us, every eye will see him. This is an aspect of Christ's second coming that's pivotal. More important for today than any other time in history. We're in this postmodern era, relativism, knowledge, truth. Right? Uh, morality exists in relation to culture. That's the idea, that there is no absolute truth. When personal truths are affirmed, the universe as a whole is an illusion. And that sounds silly, but when you hear someone say something like, you know, well, that's what you believe. That's your truth. You have your truth, and I have my truth. That's what they're saying. You have your reality, and I have mine. People are more delusional now than ever before in history. And not just with, with what's transpired in, in gender theory as of late. But when you have two men of the same sex having a wedding and then going to adopt a child and telling themselves that we're a family. That's not reality. Or, or a woman who doesn't want kids and adopts a dog and says, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a dog mom. That's not reality. You can't be a mother to a dog. And that sounds silly to say out loud, but you see the stickers on all the cars. It's everywhere, so it's being accepted. The world is full of people living in their own personal delusions. 
But what they want to do is claim that individual delusions are valid, that they should be affirmed and encouraged on a macro level. And that's philosophy. The world is whatever I think it is. That's a dangerous road to go down. The Apostle Paul warned against it. Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. And our entire world is captivated by philosophy and deeply, deeply deceiving themselves. So now understand the importance when we have an event like Halley's Comet or a solar eclipse. Because that's a reality that can be predicted and witnessed by the entire world. We're all experiencing the same universe, the same cosmos, the same world order, same world history, same world events. Now behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. And everyone's individual personal delusion, their own personal, personalized lie that they've been telling themselves in order to suppress the truth within themselves will be shattered when Jesus comes on the scene. Just like a room full of people in their own little conversation, lost in their own little worlds, and the man busts through, behold, on the scene, they will be plunged into reality. Everyone, everywhere, every eye will see. Further in verse 7, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even those who pierced him, Obviously, the individuals responsible for crucifying Jesus have been long dead. Those who pierced him were his own people. He's talking about Israel. There's the age-old question, you know, who killed Jesus? Was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? Um, we have those who pierced him contrasted by and all the tribes of the earth. That's the Gentile nations. So he's speaking about Israel piercing Jesus. Zechariah 13, 6. And one will say to him, What are these wounds between your arms? Then he will say, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Zechariah 12, 10 through 14. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. So they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of a name I can't pronounce in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves and the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shimeites by itself, and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. When Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation, all of Israel will weep bitterly, so bitterly, they'll just want to be alone. They won't even be comforted by their wives or husbands. There will be such a deep contrition, such a brokenness of realizing, we not only missed the, the Messiah, we killed him. But lo and behold, here he comes again on the clouds. When Jesus said in Matthew 23, 39, For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there will be this absolute grand repentance of Israel. And Israel will finally confess the name Jesus, our Messiah. When you read Romans eleven twenty six 26, that all of Israel will be saved, this is that time. Israel that passed through the tribulation, greeted on the other side by the one whom they pierced. Then in verse 7, we read, And all the tribes of the earth the Gentile nations. Everyone will see him and mourn over him, but not all will mourn with genuine repentance. Literally, and they shall wail over him. The Greek word is kopto, and it means literally to beat their breast in wailing and mourning. And it'll just be cries over the agonies to come from Christ's judgment. 
angry, incorrigible criminals before a holy, just judge. Repentance still will never cross their mind, even as he comes in glory on the clouds. They just gnash their teeth at him. And with this knowledge, understanding the sober reality of what it will mean for the unrepentant sinner when the Lord Jesus comes, Israel will, will demonstrate godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And the majority of the tribes of the earth will mourn Jesus' second coming with worldly sorrow that doesn't produce repentance. It leads to death. And John says, So it is to be. Amen. So be it. And there's a balanced desire of wanting all who will repent to repent. And for those who won't, so be it. Come, Lord Jesus, come. But if we truly want him to come, we will call others to repentance if we believe that he's coming. A great opportunity will be June 8th, our first of many outreaches downtown in Old Town. Uh, it'll be the second Saturday of every month on Main Street. If you feel like maybe you've just been a spectator in this war going on and you want to get involved, that'll be a good opportunity. Come ask us about it. Um, ask anybody in here about it. If you're not doing it, ask the person next to you. Everybody's doing it but you. Okay, Feel left out and want to get in. Let's look at our next verse, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. Some pose that this is the Father spoken of here. When, when the verse right before is speaking of Jesus, and the verse right after is speaking of Jesus, and we have Revelation 20, 22, verse 13, speaking of Jesus, saying the exact same thing, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So it's safe to say contextually and with cross-referencing, this is Jesus. There's a story of a Dr. Walter Martin. He's a brilliant apologist. And he took a visit to the Jehovah's Witnesses' watchtower, their headquarters, uh, sneakily. Um, and on his way out of the lobby, he passed uh, the man at the desk who was a Jehovah's Witness. JWs don't believe Jesus is God. And on his way out, he asked him, if I could show you in the Bible that Jesus is God, would you believe it? He says, it's not in the Bible. He's like, That's not what I asked you. If I could show you in the Bible that Jesus is God, would you believe it? It's not in the Bible. So he asked him again, and finally he said, if you showed me, I would believe it. And he beat on his desk, I am the Alpha and the Omega who was and is to come, the Lord God, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And he just kept on and kept on. And years later at a conference that Walter Martin was doing, the man was there. And he, he stood up and he said, uh, you visited. And he recalled the event to him. He said, that night on my bed, I couldn't sleep because all I could hear was, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And he gave his life to the Lord, the true Lord Jesus, who is God. Alpha and the Omega are the first and last letters in the Greek uh, alphabet. If you heard someone say from A to Z, it's the same thing. Uh, start to finish completely. That's what it means. Jesus is claiming he's everything. By our letters, we exchange knowledge. Any and all knowledge recorded history. Jesus is professing his omniscience. He is knowledge. All that man has, his conscience... Khan is with, science, knowledge, so with knowledge is the Lord's. All, all perception and understanding, any and all information that has ever been exchanged throughout history comes by Jesus. And for someone to even come up with a theory of evolution, they must first use the brain and mind that God gave them to do that, to think that. The Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. That's Koryas Theos. In the Greek, Koryos means supreme controller, owner, master, Lord. And now Jesus is pointing to his sovereignty as Lord. Owner, 
to possess or dispose of a thing. If you own something, you can do with it whatever you want. Master supreme over everything in history of the cosmos and the heavenlies. That's quite the managerial position. What do you, what do you manage? Oh, everything. <laughs> How long have you been doing that for? Verse 8. Who is and who was and who is to come. So now this is coupled uh, with his being omniscient, all-knowing, all-ruling for all eternity, him being Alpha and Omega. He's been God ruling throughout the ages, possessing all things, renewing and discarding as he sees fit at his own discretion. Colossians 1, 16 through 17, speaking of Jesus, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and inv invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's Lord God eternal. And the last part of verse 8, the, the triple description we're given, the Almighty. It means omnipotent. Omni meaning all. Uh, potent meaning power. You've probably heard someone describe a strong, pungent candle as being potent. So, omnipotent, omnipotent, all-powerful. It's important for a believer not to lose the proper understanding and definition of this character trait of God. Omnipotent does not mean God can do anything. This doesn't mean that God can do something illogical. For instance, God can't make a circular triangle. Or, or a better example, God can not make a person with free will and force them to love him. They would no longer have free will. It will save us from a lot of heartache and wrongfully placed frustration with God if we study him in his word so we consider him and his attributes rightly. Almighty in the Hebrew is often translated Lord of hosts, referring to Yahweh as the Lord of the armies of heaven. The book of Job translates Almighty as Shaddai, Shaddai, referring to God's power and might, both heaven and earth, and all the hosts who fill them are subject to God's power. He is the creator and possessor of all things, and all things are at God's disposal. Psalm 104, verses 24 through 35. You all sung this earlier. O Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals both small and great. There the ships move along, and Leviathan which you have formed to sport in it. They all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give to them, they gather it up. You open your hand, they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit. They are created and renewed the face of the ground. Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord be glad in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Let my meditation be pleasing to him. As for me, I shall be glad in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Let the Lord, O my soul, praise the Lord. That same Almighty, who will cause every knee to bow in every nation at his second coming, is the same Almighty who was on the throne while Job was being afflicted. He's no less omniscient, no less mighty when someone is diagnosed with cancer than when they hit the lottery. The Lord wasn't stronger for Israel in their exodus out of Egypt than he is for the Christian going into their trial today. We don't conclude God is omnipotent and all-knowing by what he does for us. Me witnessing miracles doesn't authenticate God being almighty. The Bible does. 
I know God's all-powerful because Scripture declares that He is. I don't know He's all-powerful because He really got me out of a jam last week. I was in a tough spot and God came through for me. If God didn't, quote-unquote, quote, come through, He would still be all-powerful. There's a peculiar story in the Bible, I love it, about the prophet Elisha and the sons of priests building a place to live by the Jordan River. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 5-7, through seven, But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick, threw it in there, and made the iron float. And then he said, take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and he took it. So the axe head that a man borrowed for a job flew off into the water. And the almighty, omnipotent, all-powerful God who smites Egypt with plagues, parts the Red Sea for millions to pass through on dry land, uses that same power to retrieve an axe head out of the water for some nobody. God would do that and yet let all of Job's children die and leave Job on a pile of ashes scraping boils. But God would do that for that guy, work that miracle. I've got real problems that the Almighty could just speak a word and give me some of his power and it would, it would be power well spent, let me tell you. <laughs> Haven't we all been there? Haven't we done that? done exactly what Isaiah 45, 9 says not to do. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? To criticize the all-powerful and how he's wielding his power. These verses are such a good reminder and should bring us comfort. God isn't uninformed. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He has more information to base his actions off of than we do. He sees more than we do. He has greater moral character than we do. He has greater motive than we do. He has more patience than we do. He has more wisdom than we do. He has more abilities than we do. The dumbest thing we can do is tell God what to do. He can do so much more. Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Okay, Pastor John, you really drove home the point that God is all-knowing and he's all-powerful. This knowledge isn't going to bring us any comfort and assurance if we don't know all the other characteristics of God. Maybe he is those things, all-knowing, all-powerful. What good is it if he's not loving? If he's not loving me enough to invoke those abilities over my life when I need him to? What good is his being all-knowing and all-powerful if he just sits idly by and watches me suffer? Does he love me enough not to do everything I ask him to? Love me enough not to deliver me from affliction when a trial might be the exact thing that I need? It might be the best thing for me spiritually. How patient is he? He is, he was, and is to come. He hasn't come yet. For thousands of years, he's watched every murder, rape, child abduction. He's heard every idle word, slander and blasphemy spoken against him, against his name, people murdering people in his name, and he's patient still. Why? Why is he so patient? What's he waiting for? What are his motives? God might not be implementing his omnipotence on my behalf because my suffering is something God is using for his kingdom, for his purposes, for his glory that I might never be made aware of on this side of eternity. Am I okay with that? Am I comfortable deferring to God's judgment even when it makes me uncomfortable if it results in my afflictions? 2 Corinthians 4, 17-18, you guys know this. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 
For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We trust in God because God sees everything. Seen, unseen, all the time, for all time, anytime, everywhere. He can exercise His power in whatever way He wants over any situation He chooses or chooses not to. The Christian should rejoice equally in what God does and what He does not do with His power. They are both eternally informed decisions made by the Alpha and Omega. Guys, want to get ready for passing out communion and Ben come up? If there was ever a good time and a good reason for God to intervene for someone with his power, it would have been Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus said, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And do you know what the Father said? Nothing. Nothing at all. And some of us might be praying very similar prayers this week. Lord, don't make me drink this cup. Please, if, if it's possible, please, just, could you just take this cup away from me? I know you can. The Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, I know you can just speak a word and remove this cup from me. The centurion said that about Jesus. You, you don't have to come. Just speak a word, and I know my servant will be healed. Lord, just speak a word. Please, God. My soul is so heavy laden. And the Father doesn't say a thing. We still praise Him. We still praise Him when the Almighty says nothing. He might say nothing. It doesn't mean He's doing nothing. Jesus said, my Father is working until now, and I myself am working. He's doing something. We just don't always know what. We rarely know what. But when humble servants submit, just do what they're told, drink the cup that they're handed to, that they're handed, look what happens. That's how our salvation was brought to us. Philippians 2.8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As communion is passed out, let's remember that. The incredible loving sacrifice of Jesus, having a greater desire to obey than be delivered. Amen? Good man. Jesus, my
Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took him with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to grieve and, and be distressed. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. He left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Betrayed by his friend, abandoned by his comrades, bound, mocked, spit on, flogged, stabbed, nailed to a tree, forsaken by the Father. We drink these cups in remembrance of Jesus drinking his cup which was our cup, the wrath of God for us, he drank for us. The bread, his body that he laid down to be broken for us. And the, the cup represents his blood and the new covenant poured out for us. Will you eat and drink with me? We all stand. He said, when you do this, you proclaim my death. That's our freedom by his death. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for raising him, Lord, proving that his sacrifice was sufficient. Thank you for his ascension, Lord, and his being seated at, at your right hand on high, where he rules. And thank you for sending your spirit, Lord, to fill us and change us and fashion us to the image of your son. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the deliverance from our sin, Lord, the only deliverance that that really matters. The deliverance that enabled us to serve you faithfully. Thank you. Please bless everyone here today, Lord, for, for coming to seek you, to seek your face. Guard them, strengthen them. Lead their steps, Lord. Give them clarity and discernment of your will over their lives and give us hearts to submit. We love you and we praise you. We live for you, for your glory. We do it all in the name of your Son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.